We are here to worship the Lord together in what will be a foretaste of, of eternity, and it's good to see you. Appreciate you being here. It's July, and July, if you didn't know it, you know, every month of the year has like 15 different holidays that some group assigns to it. One month is Chocolate Lovers Month. One, lump, one month is uh, Lovers of, of Red and Yellow Skittles but Not Green Skittles Month. I mean, there's all sorts of goofy stuff. What you probably didn't know is in church world, July is the month of everybody in the church disappearing attendance month. And so um, uh, I appreciate that you're here today, church family, because here's the reality. And it's, it's good to go on vacation. That's not a knock. That's not a don't worry if you go on vacation this month. I don't think ill of you. But it is a reminder that God doesn't take July off, God doesn't take vacations, and God is present today, and God is good, and I pray you are ready to encounter Him. Here's the question this morning, how do we, when it comes to God, how do we tangibly experience the, the personal presence of God in our lives, the hand of God upon our lives? How do we, how do, we do that? How do, we, how do we live in such a way where we know and are keenly aware of God's presence filling every part of our life and His hand guiding firmly upon our life? That, that question is at, the, is, is at the heart of what the chronicler, the writer of First and Second Chronicles, which originally just one, one book, the writer of Chronicles, it's at the heart of what he's writing. Remind us, the book of Chronicles is written to that group of Jews that have experienced exile in Babylon. So all the stories we're walking through took place several hundred years prior to these individuals' lives. They have been in exile. God has brought them, begun bringing them back to the promised land, to Jerusalem, where their city is in ruins. The walls are torn down. The temple that for those who are younger, they've heard the stories of their grandparents of the splendor of the temple. The temple is destroyed, and they are surrounded by pagan peoples who are hostile, who are seeking to destroy them, and the temptation for all of them to bow the knee, to depend upon idols is real. And to them, the chronicler writes, and he writes these this history of the kings of Judah, and at the heart of it is how, uh, the question is how do we live in such a way aware of God's presence, but the desire is that we would be living in such a way that we are tangibly, deeply knowing the presence of God in and the hand of God upon our lives. How does that happen? Well, I invite you to turn with me to Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles chapter 17. 2 Chronicles 17, and you'll remember the last three Sundays we've walked through 14, 15, and 16, and we've looked at the reign of King Asa, and King Asa starts well. He is the first in three generations to seek the Lord. He seeks the Lord, leads the people in reform, uh, the greatest threat ever faced by the nation of Israel, the largest army. They seek the Lord. The Lord delivers. They come back. They hear a, a stern cry to seek the Lord with greater fervor. They do it, and then you get to the surprising end of his life where he becomes the first king to persecute God's prophets, not because he was worshiping idols, but because he became proud in his own self-reliance. And over that last five years of his, five, six years of his reign, there will be wars. It will be a time of tension, ill news. Society will feel chaotic, and it's in that that we come to chapter 17. Jehoshaphat, his son, then became king in his place. And Jehoshaphat made his position over Israel firm. He placed troops in all the fortified cities of Judah. He set garrisons in the land of Judah and in the cities of Ephraim, which Asa, his father, had captured. Here's what happens. Jehoshaphat comes to the throne. Asa passes away. Jehoshaphat becomes king, and, and he sets about making sure that his his leadership and his rule over Judah, the southern kingdom, is firm, and in his rule being firm over Judah, he makes sure that his, his power against the northern kingdom of Israel, which presents really the greatest threat, is also firm. And he begins to fortify, to set protections in place throughout the kingdom. Now here's why his rule is firm. Look at me, verse 3. The Lord was with Jehoshaphat. 
because he followed the example of his father David's earlier days and he did not seek the Baals. But he sought the God of his father, followed God's commandments, and he did not act as Israel did. So the Lord established the kingdom in his control. And all Judah brought tribute to Jehoshaphat, and he took great riches and honor, and he took great pride in the ways of the Lord, and and again removed the high places and the Asherim from Judah. Here we discover the secret to, to his rule being firm. It's, it's, it's the Lord. It's the Lord who is with Jehoshaphat. It is the Lord who establishes the kingdom under Jehoshaphat's control. It's, it's the Lord who is enabling and, and, and whose, whose presence is, is tangibly in Jehoshaphat's life, whose hand is upon Jehoshaphat's life to, to make his rule firm, to establish the kingdom. And there's a reason why God's presence is with Jehoshaphat and his hand is upon his life. It says, because Jehoshaphat walked in the ways of his father David. Literally, Jehoshaphat followed the footsteps of David. Now, time does not permit and it's not needed to understand what we mean by that because the passage is going to spell out what the example, the footsteps of David, the footsteps of David are. We know from Scripture that that David, we don't have time for us to go do an expose of David's life, but we know David is summed up as a man after God's own heart. David was not a perfect man. There's glaring issues of sin in his life. But David sincerely trusted the Lord at his word. He might fall, but when he fell and was confronted, he then got to his knees and repented and turned back. His life was courageous. His life was marked by by humility. His life was marked by a confident faith, a righteous leadership. These things marked the life of David. And it's in David's example that Jehoshaphat begins to walk with God. Well, what does that look like? Well, look back with me. It says he followed, he walked the footsteps of his father David and did not seek the bells, and did not act as Israel did, but he sought the God of his father. He followed God's Commandments. What does it look like for Jehoshaphat to walk in the footsteps of David? It's the fact that he seeks God. To seek is to to put effort into chasing down one's desires. Let's put it a different way. Jehoshaphat desired God. He wanted to know God. He wanted to experience what it means to know God. He wanted to, to, to walk with God. Not... His desire was not to just be a religious influencer. Here he's the king, let me say some. He wants to walk the walk before he ever talks the talk. Jehoshaphat seeks God. Not only that, but there's no division between seeking God and obeying God's word. It says he sought God and he followed God's commandments. Jehoshaphat's desire to know God, it leads him to the natural consequence, which is if you want to know God... You take him at his word, and if you want to experience life with God, do what he says. He honors the word of God. Now, both of these are in contrast. Did you notice it says he he sought God? He did not seek the Baals. He followed God's commandments. He did not act as Israel did. Here's what's key. In, In Chronicles, the writer of Chronicles is focused more on the kings of Judah the kings that are of the bloodline of David, the messianic line, the promised line. What is taking place in Israel during the time of Jehoshaphat's reign is is a king will arise in Israel following Basha, whom we saw Asa uh, fear last week. There is a king who will arise by the name of Omri, Now, Omri probably does not get that much attention in our Sunday school lessons when you're a kid. But Omri will usher in a new season of strength and prosperity for the northern kingdom of Israel. He will be the one that that moves the northern kingdom's capital to the city of Samaria. He will be the one who, who arranges a very famous, for all the wrong reasons, marriage for his son, Ahab with Jezebel. 
And it will be Omri who begins the process, Ahab and Jezebel who bring it full swing of bringing and ushering in and encouraging the people of the northern kingdom, the Jews of the northern kingdom, the, the ten tribes, to worship the Baals. And understand, in Israel, it wasn't we worship Baal and not God, it's we, we worship God. And we worship the Baals. There was a syncretism that says, well, yeah, God is God and we worship the Baals. And we offer our offerings to get the, And if you are down in the southern kingdom, you, you are certainly aware of what's taking place, this idolatry, but you are also watching how it played out practically, especially Jehoshaphat. Because how it played out practically in the northern kingdom is the rich got richer and the, more, the powerful became more powerful. There would have been a very real temptation for Jehoshaphat to look north to see what's going on in culture and to go, you know what? That's going pretty good. Maybe I should try some of that. But that is not who Jehoshaphat is. Instead of seeking the bells, instead of doing as Israel does, he seeks God. There is a simple, undivided loyalty to God. He seeks God. He seeks to know God. He seeks to honor God. He followed his commands. By the way, to follow God's commands means that Jehoshaphat had to know where those commands are, which is in the Word of God. Jehoshaphat seeks, so the Lord is with him. The Lord established the kingdom all Judah brings uh, tribute to Jehoshaphat. And look at this, not only does Jehoshaphat seek God, not only does he uh, obey his commands, but look at verse 6. He took great pride in the ways of the Lord. This is a fascinating use of this word. Because this word and almost any other use in the Old Testament, it means to be haughty, to be high on oneself, to be arrogant. It is used in a negative context. But here it's used positively. That who God is, how God acts, God's ways. It says that Jehoshaphat, he was high, haughty, cheerful. Far from being arrogant, he was humble because he was arrogant in who God is and how God acts. There was a delight in Jehoshaphat's heart regarding who God is, how God acts, what God says. And it was that, that pride in who God is and how God acts. Look what it says. He took great pride in the ways of the Lord and again removed the high places. The strength to go about and remove idolatry, the strength to overcome the lower affection of temptation came because there was a higher affection of delight in the Lord. And, and, and any people... And there's a real danger for us. We're, we're no different. Nobody drifts into pursuit of God. We drift to idolatry. Asa had rid the land of idols. But in those years where Asa became self-reliant and proud, where his worship of God was diminished, the people looked north and saw the idolatry and drifted towards the idolatry. The Asherim poles came up once again, and it was the pride of who God is, the delight in who God is in God's ways, what God says, how God acts, how God calls us to act that drove Jehoshaphat to remove the idols once again for the good of the people. Not only this, but he goes further. Now, let me give you a service announcement. I have read this passage out loud to my dad, who's in town, the seminary professor, to make sure I say these names correctly. I may butcher them, and I promise it's not because I'm dumb and ill-studied. It is just because some of them are different. And if you think, well, pastor, we could say that well, well, I encourage you to name your kid or grandkid one of these names and see how well you do for the rest of your life. Here's what Jehoshaphat does. Look at verse 7. He doesn't just stop with removing the idols, but look what he does. In the third year of his reign, now that's significant because it's very possible, and many believe that, that, that Jehoshaphat actually co-reigned with King Asa the last few years of Asa's life where Asa became so debilitatingly ill. To say that this takes place in the third year of Jehoshaphat's reign means this is the first point Jehoshaphat is truly the king which tells us we see what his priority is. He wastes no time once he has control. In the third year of his reign, he sent his officials, Ben-Hale, Obadiah, Zechariah, Nethanel, 
Micaiah, to teach in the cities of Judah. And with them, the Levites, Shemaiah, Nethaniah, Zebediah, Asahel, Samiramoth, Jehonathan, Adonijah, Tobijah, Tobadonijah, the Levites. And with them, he sent Elishama and Jehoram, the priests. Oh, thank you. <laughs> the ultimate tongue twister. Just try to read through that quickly. They taught in Judah, having the book of the law of the Lord with them, and they went throughout all the cities of Judah and taught amongst the peoples. Notice what he does. He doesn't just come in and go, hey, no more idolatry, we're going to remove these things, but he takes his officials, his leading government officials, not only the officials, but the Levites, the priestly class, not only the Levites, but several of the serving priests, and he sends them city by city, town by town, to go into these cities and not just say, well, no more idols, no more Baal, but to teach the actual people the word of the Lord. It even says the word of the Lord was with them. They went and they took the scrolls and they taught the people. Remember, this is not a day and age where you and I, you and I are blessed. Let's say for some reason you get cut off and you're not able to, to look up any sermons or go to church or be a part of a Sunday school. You at least have access to an English Bible where you can read God's word for yourself. They didn't have access. The scrolls were giant. They were kept in the temple. Jehoshaphat, his love for his people is not just to remove the destruction of idolatry, but it's that every individual person throughout all the towns that they would be trained in the word of the Lord to know the Lord themselves. And so he sends the officials, the priests, and here's the result, we saw earlier God was with Jehoshaphat. God established Jehoshaphat. The, he establishes the, the, the firmness of his kingdom there, but, but look what also happens. Now the dread, the fear of the Lord was on all the kingdoms and the lands which were around Judah so that they did not make war against Jehoshaphat. They made war against Asa, but no longer do they make war against Jehoshaphat because God has so firmly demonstrated his presence in the land. God has so firmly honored Jehoshaphat's leadership that the nations, when it says that they dread, uh, there's certainly an indi they, they look at Jehoshaphat and they are afraid, but there's another aspect of that, which is the nations look at Jehoshaphat and they recognize Judah's God is real and we don't want to mess with him. Something that had not been on the land of Israel since the time of David and Solomon's good days. They saw the glory of God, the nations, and they did not make war. In fact, some of the Philistines brought gifts of silver as tribute to Jehoshaphat. The Arabians brought him flocks, 7,700 rams, 7,700 male goats. So Jehoshaphat grew greater and greater, and he built fortresses and store cities in Judah, he had large supplies in the cities of Judah and warriors, valiant men. These were not just guys who signed up to be, these were the Navy SEALs. Valiant men in Jerusalem. And this was their muster according to their father's households of Judah, commanders of thousands. Adna was the commander and with him 300,000 valiant warriors. And next to him was Johanan, the commander, and with him 280,000. And next to him was Amasiah, the son of Zikri, who volunteered for the Lord, and with him 200,000 valiant warriors. And of Benjamin, Eliada, a valiant warrior, and with him 200,000 armed with bow and shield. And next to him, Jehozabad, and with him 180,000 equipped for war. These are those who serve the king apart from those whom the king put in the fortified cities throughout all of Judah. Now, I just read those names and numbers, and unless you're a really astute math person, you probably didn't add it all up, but here's really key if you add it up. You add all those numbers up, what you end up with is you end up with an army of 1.16 million valiant warriors. That is twice the size of the greatest army under his father. That is the largest recorded army of the people of God in the book of Chronicles, save David's census. Do you notice it? He, he, he is this army. His army fills some with volunteers. There is such a spirit of selflessness in the land that you have men volunteering for the Lord. They're not required to step into this role, but they do it willingly to serve and to protect the people. There is a selflessness 
of love for one another that begins to infect the land as God establishes Jehoshaphat's rule as the people learn the word. And it says that Jehoshaphat, verse 12, became greater and greater. It's the same words that in the prior chapter described how Asa's disease in his feet became more and more severe. In Asa's pride of self-reliance, his pain becomes more and more greater. In Jehoshaphat's simple-hearted love and devotion to seek the Lord, to follow His commands, to delight himself in the Lord through the teaching of the Word, the learning of the Word, the doing of the Word, through His selfless actions to care for the sheep He is in charge as the, the king shepherd over, God makes Jehoshaphat greater and greater. Indeed, as you walk through this church family, don't miss the point. We are given an example of Jehoshaphat, of how Jehoshaphat lived, but, but the point is all over the place. It is not Jehoshaphat who made himself great. It is God who is with Jehoshaphat. It's because God is with Jehoshaphat that God establishes Jehoshaphat. It is because God is with Jehoshaphat that not only does he establish Jehoshaphat, but he so displays his goodness, greatness, and glory through Jehoshaphat and the nation of Judah that the, the other nations around them are, are living in terror because they recognize there is something real going on there. There is a God in Judah that is greater than us. The point is, God delights to be with His people. God delights to firmly establish His kingdom among His people. God delights to brilliantly display His glory through His people. That's the point. And you and I need to be clear today on this, church family. If the question is, how do I, do I have the presence of God in my life? You need to, we need to start with this truth. And the truth is that God delights to be with His people. Where was God with Adam and Eve in the garden? Walking, present with His people. What does Jesus say about He goes to make a place for us? Why? That where I am, you may be. Well, why? Because He wants us there. What is the great name we celebrate at Christmas? Emmanuel. What does it mean? God with us. What is our hope of glory? Christ in us. How does it all end? Revelation 21 and 22. We who are in Christ, saved by grace through faith, we see Him and live in fellowship with Him forever. When you go from cover to cover in Scripture, you do not find a God who delights in hiding Himself and staying hidden. You don't see a God who goes, oh, you stinky little human, stay at arm's length. You see a God who chases after broken image bearers, who, who sends His Son to the cross because He actually delights to reconcile and save us because He delights to be with us. You and I need to understand God delights to be with His people. Because He delights to be with His people, the rest is all a consequence. God delights to establish His kingdom among us. Now, the kingdom I'm speaking of is not the same as the Old Testament Judah. We live on the other side of Jesus' death and resurrection. We're not under the Old Covenant, but the New. I'm speaking of God's eternal kingdom. God has a kingdom that is coming, that is here in part of which we are ambassadors, and as a local church, what your experience, what our experience together as a local church, it should be a foretaste of God's kingdom. Because it is the foretaste of God's kingdom. God has a purpose, a, 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 a plan to make a loving, unified family filled with fellowship amongst us, and He delights to do it. When we pray, oh Lord, unify us. Oh Lord, bring your fellowship. God's not going, well, pray a little harder. I'm not sure I want to do that. Convince me. God delights to do that. God delights to display his glory through us. Listen, nobody wants the will of God more for each of our lives than God. Nobody wants the will of God for this church more than God. No one has the power to bring about the will of God in our lives and in this church than God. Nobody delights more in the will of God than God. Nobody wants to use our lives more for His kingdom than God. 
God works, wants, and wills to make himself seen clearly through our lives. So what do we mean when we say he is with us? Now this is vital, church family. When you look at the Old Covenant and you go back to even what Asa was taught in chapter 15 and then rebuked in chapter 16. In the Old Covenant, God said, I will be with you as you walk in my ways. Now remember, God being with, what we mean by God being with all throughout, it's not his omnipresence. It's not as if God says, well, I'll be present around you and if you don't, I'll remove my, listen, God can't remove his presence from anywhere. God is present everywhere. He's omnipresent. But what we mean by his presence is his personal presence to guide, to lead, to protect, to bless. It's the experience of that aspect of his personal presence, God with us. In the Old Testament, God would provide that protection, that guidance, that that joy, that fellowship, and, and literally for old Israel, health, wealth, and prosperity as long as they walked in his ways. Let me be clear, we as the church, we're not Old Testament Israel. We're members of the eternal kingdom. We're not kings of Judah. When said, we are sons and daughters of the Most High. And when we say that God is with us, it is not a promise that if you just walk with God rightly, you'll get health, wealth, and prosperity. No, that actually goes against nearly everything told to us in the New Testament. Where Paul says, if you desire to walk a godly life, you will be persecuted. No, what it means that God is with us is it means we are promised joy indescribable in this life and eternity. We are promised peace uncomprehensible in this life and eternity. And we are promised life eternal which begins now and once we get to eternity will be filled with health, wealth, and prosperity. God being with us now, it is honest about the suffering and sorrows, the pain and trials we go through because the God who is with us and in us by grace through faith, Jesus Christ, has been tempted and tried in every way as we, yet without sin. What does it mean that God is with us? Listen, because we are New Testament believers who are saved by grace, not by works of righteousness, If you have been saved by the blood of Jesus, received by the grace of God through faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ, if you have been biblically saved by Jesus, all this truth about God delighting to be with us, please understand this. Because we are under the new covenant, God being with us is not dependent on our performance in the covenant. God being with us is solely dependent on His grace, which is why Jesus looks at us and says, I am with you always, period. On your good days, on your bad days, the days you check all the boxes, the day you leave them all blank. I am with you always. I am faithful when you are faithless because God cannot deny Himself, 2 Timothy 2. Because you and I, if you are in Christ as a new covenant believer, we are saved by grace through faith, which means He is with us. He delights to be with us. And the fact that He is with us means He will lead, He will guide, He will comfort. By the way, it's why He disciplines us. Because He's with us. That's the point of the passage. You want... We have to understand that God delights to be with His people. Now here comes the question. The real question is not how then do we experience it. The real question is this. Do we want to experience it? Well, pastor, this is great truth. What do we do? Well, listen, what do we do? If God delights to be with His people, if God delights to establish His kingdom among us, if God delights to shine His glory through us, then what we must do is walk in the footsteps of David. To quote straight out of the passage. To walk in the footsteps of David. Well, well, what what does that look like? Well, one, it looks like seeking the Lord's presence. We must seek the Lord's presence. What do we mean by that? We mean a heart that is fixated on knowing and loving and following Jesus. When we talk about seeking the Lord's presence, it starts with a, a, for lack of a better term, we've all heard mindset. Let's start with a heart set. 
It starts with a heart that is set on simply and singularly being devoted to know Jesus truly, to love Jesus fully, to follow Jesus faithfully. This kind of seeking is spoken in other terms in the New Testament. Jesus will use the terms in John 15 to abide in Christ by faith. Paul will use the language in Galatians uh, 5 to walk in the Spirit, in Corinthians to walk by faith. Seeking is not just some ethereal abstract, why am I seeking? But it is a tangible, simple, single-hearted desire to know Jesus for real. To see my affections every day more and more transformed to where I love Him more. Which then leads to the fact that I follow Him faithfully. That's what it means. It's a heart fixated and set on that. Now understand, we don't seek God to earn Him. If you hear today and go, oh man, okay, here's, I, wanna, I want God to be with me. Here's, here's all the stuff I've got to go do. Then one... Per, if you think you've got to go do this stuff here, clearly, if you want God with you, get saved. Be reconciled to Christ. That's how God is with you. It happens in salvation by grace through faith. If you've been saved, then understand, we seek God not to get Him. We seek God because He first sought us. So we rest in Him. We seek from a place of rest And we seek with a boldness and confidence. The enemy's condemnation which taunts us and says, why would God want to be with you? You lost your temper on the road the other day. Why would God want to be with you? Well, listen, I'm not saying God's proud of me losing my temper on the road. He's not. That's not evidence of fruit of the Spirit either. But if I've been saved by grace through faith, you want to know why God wants me? Because he adopted me through the blood of Jesus as a son. And what it should produce is a seeking of God that is bold and confident. Bold. Bold to run into God's throne room past the taunts of the enemy. Bold to run into God's throne room on the basis of Jesus, confident to know that if I seek, He delights to be found because He's already with me. He's not hiding. Listen, let me put it two different ways. I am a flawed father. But as a flawed father, there is never a time if my children run into the office where I'm not delighted because they're my kids. God didn't crush Jesus on the cross to deal with us begrudgingly. He delights. Not only that, several weeks ago I told you a story about my grandfather who everybody knows for all of the pastoring and life boy and this or that, and I told you the real secret is Papa's the greatest hide-and-seek player that's ever lived. And when I was in elementary school, we were up in Tennessee visiting, and he and I play hide-and-go-seek. And I still to this day don't know where he hid. And someone asked me, well, does he know where he hid? And I said, no, I think he's long forgotten that. That was like 30 years ago. But here's the other part of that story. At a certain point, I couldn't find Papa. It went on for 15, 20 minutes. I was everywhere around the house. Couldn't find him. And when I cried out, Papa, I can't find you. Please come out. Papa didn't stay hidden another 30 minutes to make me sweat it out. He delighted to come out and be found. You and I, if we understand the truth that God delights to be with us, it should transform the, how we pursue God. It means when I get in the closet to pray, I don't get in and listen to that thought that said, why would God want to listen to you today? I get in and go, Lord, if there's anything in my life that would damage my prayer life, show me, and I'm trusting you love me enough to show me. And if you don't show me something, then I'm going to pray like a son with boldness and confidence. When I open up the word, I'm going to read like you want to meet me here because your word is clear. You delight to be with your people. It should transform how we seek and listen, seeking God is not seeking in perfection. If, if God won't be found until we seek Him perfectly, we'll never find Him. 
When you hear in the previous chapter, when you, uh, God's eyes scour the earth for the heart that is completely his, the, the kind of seeking we are talking about is not perfection, but is a simple, singular, sincere pursuit. Meaning, God, I may not be perfect, but you are my God. No other God is my God. I might make a mistake, but notice the difference. David commits adultery and murders a man. And when he's confronted with his sin, he falls down in humility and repents. Asa makes just a dumb decision. And when he's rebuked, he digs his heels in unrelenting. You want to know what a true, simple-hearted pursuit of God looks like? It doesn't look like you do it all perfect. It does look like when you mess up, there is a quickness to brokenness and humility and not a stubbornness to dig your heels in. We seek God versus man's idols. We pride. If we seek the Lord, what is it going to look like to walk in the footsteps of David? It's going to mean priding in the Lord's ways. Listen, Jehoshaphat is high, he's proud, he's haughty in the Lord and his ways. Jokingly can say he's arrogant in who God is and how God acts. There is a cheerfulness, a delight, a bold confidence, a courageous joy, a happy disposition in Jehoshaphat's life because he so delights in who God is and how God acts. Do we have that same delight in the Lord's character and ways? Do we know who God is so that we can delight in Him? It's hard to delight in someone you know nothing about. You cannot delight in someone you do not know by grace through faith. Do we know who He is? Are we proud of who God is? Maybe put it a different way. Are we proud that we are His? Or has the temptation and idols of our culture caused us to tuck our tails sometimes because our God is not really popular for this lost culture? We should be proud that God is gracious. We should be proud that He is merciful. We should be proud that He is loving. We should be proud that He is just, proud that He is righteous, proud that He is wrath. We should be proud of who He is. We should delight in who He is. Are more of my thoughts when I relate to the Lord focused on myself, how I feel, and how I fall short? Am I more discouraged at my lack and my weakness, or are my thoughts completely fixated by choice? By the way, this is a choice to pride myself. Are my thoughts fixated on the wonder and greatness of who God is? Do I delight in how God acts? God doesn't do things how we do them. Am I proud of what he says? Am I proud of his ways? Sometimes what he says is hard to accept. Sometimes, according to this world, to to come in, in line and follow his commands will seem costly and painful. And I can be fixated on the costliness and painfulness of it, or I can be fixated on the delight that there is not a single word of the Lord that will ever disappoint your soul. My soul may need to be corrected in disappointment. My expectations may be disappointed, but if I will really delight in the Lord and delight in His ways, oh, the depths of joy and peace I will know. When God says, this is who I am and this is how I've designed you to live, there is nothing in God's design that is a killjoy. It's good, which is why we can delight in it. And it's this pride in the Lord's character and ways that drives the ability to remove idols. You want to know the true way to overcome the temptation towards the various idols in our life? It's not constantly thinking about how to say no to the idol. It is constantly with my mind setting my affections and delighting on the greatness of who God is and what he does. That's how I say no and find the strength to stand against temptation. We seek the Lord. We pride in the Lord's ways. We honor the Lord's word. If you want to walk in the footsteps of David, we honor the Lord's word. Jehoshaphat learned the word. He learned it enough to know how to follow it. By the way, church family, I'll just encourage all of us, if you don't know how to read your Bible, let us teach you. We we try to offer multiple times a year. You need to learn and have enough humility to say, I need to learn how to read His Word. 
I need to learn how to meet God in His Word, how to hear Him through His Word. Jehoshaphat learned how to walk with God. He learned how to know the Word. And learning to know the Word, because he sought the Lord and delighted in the Lord's ways, he did what the the Word said. You want to experience tangibly the goodness of God's presence and hand on your life and to walk with that confidence? Walk according to the Word by the grace and power of the Holy Spirit. Not only this, he didn't just learn the Word and obey the Word, he taught the Word. He taught the Word. He taught the Word because ultimately, if you and I walk in the footsteps of David, we seek the Lord, we pride ourselves in the Lord's character, we honor His Word, which will all lead us to have a heart that looks out for others. I saw a quote this week, said, the goal of Christian maturity is ministry. It's not knowledge. It's ministry. God has gift. God, if you are saved, God's given you spiritual gifts. We're going to see in Ephesians shortly, and when we get back in August, that God has actually created us as the body to do ministry. Not just the pastors, it's the body of Christ, the saints that do the ministry. Jehoshaphat looks out. He's driven for the good of his people. He removes the idols. He protects the people with valiant warriors. He teaches the word. There is a a concern for the welfare and health of others around him. And if you and I are going to walk in the footsteps of David, where we tangibly experience the presence of God in and the power of the hand of God on our life, it's going to mean first we have a disposition that seeks the Lord. That disposition that seeks the Lord is going to have to make a choice to delight ourselves in the Lord. If we're seeking and delighting in the Lord, it means we honor his word. We take his word serious. And if we take his word serious, what it's going to lead us tangibly to do is to act for the good, for God's good in each other's lives. It's going to lead to a spirit. Notice back there in the list of all the warriors. It says one of them was the one who volunteered for the service. If we will walk in the footsteps of David, it will lead us to a selfless love that says, Lord, here am I, use me. And then is confident that God's going to be with us to use us because God delights to be with his people. God delights to establish the foretaste of eternity, his kingdom amongst his people. And God delights to display his glory through his people. So church family, may we be found in the days to come where there will be ill news, where it will feel chaotic, where there will be tension. May we be found to walk in the footsteps of David, seeking the Lord with an undivided heart, delighting in the Lord, honoring the Lord's word, and caring for one another. Let's pray. Jesus, we look to you in this time. This is your invitation. However you would have us respond, Jesus, may we seek you. It's in your name I pray, Jesus.